and let's go to the first section of today's class titled winged creatures section 1 wait for birds and words subtitle as bots or bird watchers so that is a connection between you know um, those who watch or wait for birds and those who wait for words poets so that's the first one ornithologists and wordsmiths so here is a, a snippet from the indian poet nizam ezekiel's poem poet lover and bird watcher okay there's no and here so these are the words the best poets wait for words the hunt is not an exercise of will but patient love relaxing on a hill to note the moment of a timid wing so in this poem poet lover bird watcher nizam ezekiel compares you know three people one poets two lovers three bird watchers the essential thing or the commonality between these three is that patience they have to patiently wait for something they want to achieve poets wait for you know words and lovers they have to wait for you know a signal from the lady love or the love then bird watchers very you know they need patience to you know there is some sighting of a wing or a whistle from a bird so ultimately they will, they all will be rewarded maybe in most cases sometimes they may not be rewarded they have to wait forever but once they get what they want and think uh, they are happy you know that's how this poet has come up with this poem right the best poet wait for words and next one is from the french symbolist poet charles baudelaire the albatross so here the bird is not compared is again compared with the poet so in the earlier poem the bird versus the poet versus the bird watcher here is more about the bird is a symbol of, you know it's a symbol for the poet um a poet when he is among his people in the sense those who you know appreciate literature those who you know love poetry i think he is considered as a king a prince whereas when he is among or she is among common people you know those who are after material things i think um, the poet is not considered a great being so that's what happens to albatross and that's what is happening to this poet represented here so that's why so earlier he is more like an aeroplane not in the sky so now he is grounded so a grounded flyer so look at this the poet resembles the prince of the clouds so you know it's a kind of a majestic being both the albatross and the poet who is friendly to the tempest and laughs at the bowman now they don't bother about the arrows you know uh, being shot at them uh, they elude all the criticism you know when they are in the air the albatrosses and poets but banish to ground in the midst of hootings h o o t i n g s t i n g s so hootings now they are being criticized and his wings those of a giant hinder him from walking the poet is very much aware of his talent and very much aware that he you know he doesn't belong here you know among people where uh, you know, who who don't bother about poetry or don't bother about literature you know they are after something else so is an odd man out or odd woman out here so that's a, a comparison here by charles baudelaire the albatross then again let's go for a connection between birds and poets we have our own man the swan of avon so here is a poem by an elegy by ben johnson elizabethan poet so he wrote this elegy um title you know uh, to the memory of my beloved the author william shakespeare to the first folio published in 1623 so this how he writes sweet swan of avon what a sight it were to see thee in 
our waters yet appear. So Ben Johnson is actually talking about the native place of Shakespeare. He was born in Stratford upon Avon. And why swan? Because in the river Avon, there were a lot of swans. And the sweetest among them is uh, among them was Shakespeare. And that bird had come uh, to Thames now. So it's a kind of Shakespeare leaving Stratford for London. Now he's in London. So Ben Johnson uh, feels honored by his presence. So sweet swan of Avon, what sight it were to see thee in our waters it appear and make those flights upon the banks of Thames. So here is a bird from the Avon River and it has come to the Thames. And Thames is known for its um, uh, you know, beauty as well as its uh, history. Because look at the people who are uh, representing Thames here. That so did Elizabeth, I mean, Eliza and our James. So Queen Elizabeth and James I. So now he, he belongs, you know, he belongs among, you know, among the royalty. So that's what uh, Ben Johnson means. So in the same poem, he talks about a small Latin and less Greek, despite uh, knowing small Latin and less Greek, uh, Shakespeare delivered in the London scene. And that's his price. And Shakespeare left Stratford in 1585 and he left for London. We don't have enough evidence what happened in between, you know, the years, uh, we call it lost years, 1685, sorry, 1585 and 1592. And 1592, we have a document, a pamphlet by the University Wit, Robert Green. Grot's Worth of Wit, published in 1592, it's a, it's a it's an important document because this is how we come to know that Shakespeare reached uh, Shakespeare is in London Shakespeare was in London there and he was um, actually jolting many people because of his uh, through his wit so Robert Green calls Shakespeare an abstract crew beautified with our feather feathers what does it mean so when we say say an upstart crow, one who is very pompous, a, sh a showy, no, uh, a showy person, one, one who shows off his talent or her talent. But Green also accuses Shakespeare of plagiarism. Green says, you are from a countryside and what you do, you are just a crow, but you beautify yourself by borrowing you know, words, uh, wings from university wits. You do not have wit of your own. You are a poor fellow. So he called Shakespeare a plagiarist, but he was proved wrong later. So that's the sentence here means an abstract crow beautified with our wings. You do not have originality. You borrow everything from us, from Thomas Keats or Marlowe. You are just a borrower. You are not an original. So that's an accusation against Shakespeare by Robert Greene. But today we read more Shakespeare than Robert Greene, uh, right? But anyway, why we respect Robert Greene is for this documentation, 1592, you know, that last year is over in the sense we do not have any evidence between uh, 1585 and 1592. We call this period uh, dark or uh, lost years. And now that's over. Then we know Shakespeare, is, Shakespeare was there and Shakespeare you know, did something majestic in London. Again, we'll go to the connection between birds and poets. Uh, this time from the romantic poet, John Keats. So John Keats in his poem, Ode to a Nighting Girl, writes like this, Away, away, for I will fly to thee, not charioted by Bacchus and his parts, but on the viewless wings of poesy. And he calls this bird, Nightingale, immortal bird. Now, who is Bacchus here? Bacchus is a god of wine. And generally, Bacchus inspires poets and artists. 
But Kate says, I'm not inspired by Bacchus today, but I'm inspired by the Nighting Girl. And I don't need Bacchus or his parts, P-A-R-T-S. Parts here represents leopard, right? Part, leopard, uh, which is uh, Bacchus vehicle. So John Kate says, no, I'm not bothered about uh, Bacchus here, uh, today. So away, away, for I will fly to thee. So I'm coming to you, bird. Not charioted by Bacchus and his parts, but on the viewless wings of poesy. So through poetry, I'm going to reach you. So he wants to be one with this beautiful bird called Nightingale, and he enjoys his music. So he joins a kind of a chorus uh, with the Nightingale through his words. And this phrase is uh, uh, often quoted, wings of poesy coined by John Keats. But maybe here, uh, a kind of a suggestion, right? Because uh, he takes um, a drink, then he grows wings. Might be kind of uh, uh, Coldrich who takes opium and grows wings of poesy. Uh, 